Hi everyone, welcome to this Taster Lecture for British Science Week 2023. My name's Dr Katie Daughters, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Essex and I think I've got a really great topic for us to talk about this week which is all about connections for British Science Week. More specifically we're going to be talking about something called the love hormone and whether it's indeed fact or fiction. So let's jump straight in. So you can Google oxytocin, which is the technical name for the love hormone, as you can Google anything. And if you look at some images, you'll find something um, a lot like the image on your top right of your screen, which really gives the cute squishy side of oxytocin as either the love hormone or the cuddle drug. Something slightly more scientific, we could look at the chemical structure of the nine amino acid peptide that makes up oxytocin, uh, like the image on the bottom right there. And in fact, you can even see tattoos of oxytocin that people have put on themselves. Or you could look at some news clippings for oxytocin. So I've just pulled out a couple of my favorites here. So the top one says why oxytocin is incredible and how to get more of it. Now that sounds like typical media hype, but it's actually a really good question. So we don't have, as scientists, a well-validated and robust way of increasing natural levels of oxytocin in the lab. Instead, if we want to run oxytocin studies, we would give our participants a nasal spray of oxytocin, but this does increase oxytocin levels well above natural levels. There are a couple of techniques we can use. So for example, some research suggests that exercise or physical touch or watching short emotive video clips can increase oxytocin, but it's not a super reliable measure as of yet. So there's no clear way to test oxytocin in a clinical setting. One of my other favorites looks at, um, can oxytocin get me a boyfriend, a personal experiment with the love hormone? So this individual purchased a nasal spray of oxytocin off the internet and took it as a nasal spray before a blind date. Now, first of all, let's be really clear, you should never purchase any medications off the internet without first consulting a medical professional. But they're not that far away in terms of scientific understanding. They did at least use it as a nasal spray, and there are plenty of researchers out there that have demonstrated that oxytocin is related to connections, which is the theme of our talk today. So where did it all start, at least from a media perspective, oxytocin really took off in the early 2000s. And it was inspired by this guy here, who's Professor Paul Zak from the United States. And he did a now infamous TED talk where he got on stage and puffed a nasal spray of oxytocin around the stage um, and told everyone that they should have three hugs a day to increase their oxytocin levels. He even went on to publish a book called The Moral Molecule, The Source of Love and Prosperity. And of course, the book and the TED talk are based on science that he conducted in his lab. However, oxytocin is a great case study for science in general. And there's another book I wanna emphasize that capsulates this idea really nicely. And it's by Ben Goldacre and it's called, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that. So the rest of the talk is gonna explain some of the original findings from the oxytocin literature and how it's just a bit more complicated than that when you look at the most current up-to-date science. But let's go right back to basics. So here is a picture of your brain cut in half on the left-hand side, and you can see there's a small little black box there. And if we zoom in on it, we get to the picture in the middle, which is showing your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland that dangles at the base of your brain. Now there are two centers in the hypothalamus that produce oxytocin, and then it's relayed via neurons down into the posterior part of the pituitary gland, where it can be released into your bloodstream. When it's in your bloodstream, oxytocin acts as a hormone, which just means that it acts over slightly longer distances and for longer timescales. Really interestingly for us as well, however, oxytocin also can be relayed from the hypothalamus directly to important areas of your brain that are related to ideas to do with connections, such as um, social behavior and emotions. So oxytocin can both act as a neuropeptide in the brain, where it acts over much shorter distances and shorter timescales, but also as a hormone in the bloodstream. So what do we know about the physiological role of oxytocin? Well, we understand that oxytocin is important for 
labor and lactation. So oxytocin is responsible for initiating uterine contractions that help push baby out of the womb. And it also does a very similar role in lactation where it causes um, contractions that expel milk from the mammary tissue. So oxytocin works in conjunction with prolactin for um, breastfeeding. And it's because of this beginning, right around um, the very beginnings of mother-infant uh, interactions, that some curious psychologists and animal uh, researchers were interested in whether it could have an effect beyond simply breastfeeding and perhaps to do with attachment. So very often our research starts in animal studies before it progresses onto human studies. And I've just pulled out two of my favorites from this area of the research. So as you can clearly see on the left-hand side, we've got some sheep here. Some really fascinating research demonstrates that when ewes give birth and they get their traditional surge of oxytocin, this surge of oxytocin actually triggers brand new neurons to be made in the brain that connect the olfactory bulb to the prefrontal cortex. Or in other words, it connects the smell center of your brain to the sophisticated behavior part of your brain like parenting behaviors. So what all of this means is that ewes will only demonstrate maternal behavior towards their own lambs because of their scent. So it's actually really difficult to foster you, um, lambs in, in use because of this oxytocin generated new neural pathways in the brain. On the right hand side, we've got something called prairie voles. Um, and now this work is all led by um, Professor Larry Young, also in the United States. And they did some really sophisticated, super interesting genetic work where we can look at not just um, the levels of oxytocin in your body, but the distribution of oxytocin receptors in the brain. So there are actually two types of provoles, one that's monogamous and one that's polygamous. So monogamous, one sexual partner, polygamous, multiple sexual partners. And what they found is that actually there's a single gene that can dictate the distribution of oxytocin receptors in the brain. And it's this distribution of receptors that actually dictates this sophisticated mating behavior. So a really nice summary of some super interesting research about the complex role that oxytocin can play in parenting behavior and sexual behavior in animals. Moving slightly closer to our own homes though, perhaps you've got a dog in the house. Um, our needy dogs actually have an oxytocin background to it. So when we give affection to our pets, they, we now know that they have an oxytocin rush. And this is actually some of the biology that underpins this emerging new field in the literature of pet therapy. Super interestingly, it actually goes both ways. So when you are interacting with your dog, you actually get a rush of oxytocin yourself. And this helps to facilitate um, the animal pet bond and also the sense of calm um, that goes along with that attachment forming. But what about parents? What about us as, as humans? So Ruth Feldman's lab, Professor Ruth Feldman in Israel, has done a lot of really interesting work on this area. And I'll just pull out one of the super interesting findings from her research. So it turns out that there are actually differences in the types of behavior that oxytocin enforces in males and females. So for mums, they get an oxytocin rush when they're doing typical mother behaviors like mother essay vocalizations or baby talk, gentle play and caring behaviors like feeding and changing. Dads, on the other hand, get an oxytocin rush when they're rough housing and doing rough play. So there's actually biological reinforcements for the different types of behaviors that we might all be familiar with in our own homes. But what about more general types of everyday human social interaction? If you've ever looked at an oxytocin paper, and I suggest you do because they're all interesting, it often starts with a sentence something like this. Oxytocin has been found to increase empathy, trust, and generosity. And so we're gonna look at each of those in turn and challenge some of those assumptions. So let's start with empathy. So a really good way to get a handle on a large sort of set of studies or a group of, um, of research is to look at something called a meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is a statistical analysis across a large number of studies, and it gives you the overall pattern of what's being found across those studies. So a recent meta-analysis by Jenny Lepan and colleagues found that oxytocin has a very specific role in empathy. 
To explain, we should be clear that empathy has two different types, cognitive empathy and affective empathy. So cognitive empathy is our ability to recognize the emotional states of others, otherwise known as interpretation for this paper. And affective empathy is the feeling of other people's emotions. So what the meta-analysis shows is that oxytocin improves our cognitive empathy or our ability to recognize the emotions of others, but it doesn't actually change the way we feel emotions. So when someone says that oxytocin increases empathy, you need to challenge them to make sure that they're being very specific about what sort of empathy they're talking about. So how can oxytocin have such a complicated and sophisticated role in our emotions? Well, something that I work really strongly from in my lab and many others adopt as well is something called the social salience hypothesis of oxytocin, most recently summarized by Shmay Suri and Abu Akel. And what the hypothesis states is that oxytocin works by increasing our awareness of social cues in our environment. So if we present something like a human face with varying different emotional expressions, and then we give someone oxytocin, they're more likely to pay attention to those subtle emotional cues. So what about trust and generosity? Well, let's go back to Paul Zak, the guy with the TED talk, Dr. Love, and look at some of his research. So the first paper is published in Nature in 2005. Now Nature is one of our most prestigious journals in science. Everybody would love to have a Nature paper. It's super popular paper and I'll show you some metrics that help demonstrate that. So you can see that it's had 35,000 views, which is a lot for a relatively small group of scientists that we are. And it's got something called 2,291 citations. Now that's where other papers that have come along since then have included that paper in their own. To give you an idea of how popular that is, your average science paper has something like 10 citations. So to have almost 3,000 citations is hugely popular and it really did trigger a huge amount of media interest and indeed science into the role of oxytocin in human behavior. And what they suggested at the time was that oxytocin increases trust in humans. And the way they did this was to work with economists and play financial games in the lab and they found that people were more likely to give away their financial resources if they'd been had given oxytocin as opposed to a placebo. And indeed they did another study called Oxytocin Increases Generosity in Humans and again a super popular paper with almost 84,000 views and again 645 citations. However, it's really important that when we're looking at science we're coming with the most up-to-date data. So if you look for oxytocin and trust in more recent science, one of the authors, Ernst Fair, from the original 2005 Nature paper, actually wanted to replicate this finding. And what they were able to demonstrate is that they couldn't replicate that finding. So I've tried to replicate it in my lab a couple of times and also not had any success. So it's really important, and oxytocin is a great case study, that you go back and make sure that some of the original findings stand the test of time. Because our understanding and our science does evolve over time and we want to make sure we're really up to date with what the latest science has to say. And if you think about it, that kind of makes sense, right? Why would a hormone make us charitable to absolutely everybody under all circumstances? That just doesn't make sense rationally and especially not from an evolutionary perspective. Instead, something called parochial altruism makes a lot more sense. So we're familiar with the idea of altruism, giving a pro-social act to somebody else without expecting anything in return. Well, parochial altruism is the idea that we should really limit those pro-social acts to our special social groups, or what we would call our in-group. So this cartoon demonstrates that really nicely. Let's say that the couple here are our special social group or our in-group, and the random stranger on the street corner is our out-group. And the umbrella is our special resource that we don't want to share. So quite rightly, this woman is outraged that her partner has given away the resources to an outgroup because really we should keep them within our special social group. So Professor Carsten de Doe in the Netherlands has done a lot of um, great work in this area and I've had uh, the privilege of working with him on a couple of occasions already. And what he's, his work summarizes is that if we give people oxytocin and we give them money, and we introduce them into a lab context where there are more than one social group. So there's your group, your special group, and then there are other groups. 
What we actually find is that oxytocin drives pro-social behavior only within the special social group or the in-group, and it drives complete indifference towards the out-group, and in some cases even motivates defensive behaviors or attacks against the out-group. So you can see that if we change the context of our lab studies, oxytocin can actually be antisocial as well as pro-social. So um, I'll give two conclusions that I would love if you would take away from today's talk. Firstly, hopefully I've demonstrated that oxytocin does play a super important role in our social behavior. And the way that it does this is by increasing our awareness of social cues in our environment. And I'll leave you with this joke. Hopefully you'll laugh if you can remember all the way back to the beginning of the talk. Uh, and if you do have any questions, I'm on Twitter and you can also drop me an email. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy British Science Week 2023.